Doris opened her eyes, glancing around her bedroom. It was late. She couldn't see the clock from where she was laying, but the silence around her house and from the street outside pointed to it being the early hours of the morning. Her children were fast asleep, tucked up in their beds many hours before. Doris knew instantly something was wrong. There was the slight feeling of electricity in the air and that all too familiar feeling of being watched. Doris began to shudder. This wasn't the first time she had been woken up in the middle of the night by seemingly nothing at all. Only then to immediately feel like she wasn't alone. In fact, it was a feeling that Doris was becoming all too used to. She glanced around her room one more time. There was nothing. Just silence and darkness. But she could feel it. Somewhere deep inside her. She wasn't alone. No matter what her eyes may be telling her. Doris decided to get out of the room as quickly as she could. Before she even had a chance to sit up, one of them pounced on her. It was hard to describe what the sensation felt like, but it seemed very much like someone was holding her arms, tightly pulling them together at the wrist. She tried to fling her lower body out of the bed, but before she could, someone else appeared to grab her by the ankles, once again pulling her legs tightly together. Doris tried to scream out, but she couldn't. In the darkness, she could almost make out the shape of a figure standing above her head. Short in stature and bent over slightly as it held onto her. It was difficult to put into words, but while she could just about make out the shape of a person, it was like they weren't actually there. Or at least, not fully. As though it were just the outline of a human being. Again glancing down at her feet, she could make out a similar shape in the darkness. Her eyes raced around the room in both terror and in an attempt to try and figure a way out of what she was experiencing. It was then that she felt it, a third presence approaching. She could see it, again just about, larger this time. She felt its weight pressed down on her as this fragment of a human climbed onto her bed. Doris was helpless. She couldn't move, and she was surrounded. She tried her hardest to let her mind go blank, praying it would be over soon. This wasn't the first time Doris had experienced this, and it wouldn't be the last. Welcome to the Tape Library. This is the case that I have referred to over the last few episodes, as the one I think you have all requested more than any other. Before we get into it, I have a small request myself. I'm in the process of putting together a rough plan of what the channel will be covering over the next year. The next few months are pretty set in stone, but are there any cases you think I should look into? I asked this before a couple of months ago and got some incredible ideas, so please do drop a comment below if you would like to suggest something. Also, a few people have been complaining that they are subscribed, but still not seeing videos when they get posted. Just hit the little bell next to the subscribe button and you should get a notification every time I upload. Despite being such a well-known incident in the paranormal world, this story has somehow passed me by, so it's been super interesting to delve into the research for this. As the warning at the start suggests, this is a dark case. While I will be attempting to not make the experience too graphic, I just want to pre-warn people that there will be discussions about some fairly heavy subjects. One tricky thing about this one is that it obviously inspired the book and movie, The Entity. While these are based on the case of Doris Bifer, they are fictional retellings of what happened to her and her family. So attempting to separate the fiction from what Doris and the investigators claimed really happened is a slight challenge. Also, the events before the investigators get involved are fairly vague, but I've tried my best to put together a fairly comprehensive view of the events as I understand them. I've relied on interviews with lead investigator Dr. Barry Taff for the majority of the details of this case. So let's get started, shall we? Grab yourself a warm drink, dim the lights, and get comfortable. It's time to tackle the true story of the entity. This is the haunting of Doris Bifer. It was a warm Californian afternoon in August of 1974. A young man named Kerry Gaynor 
was standing in a bookstore with a close friend. While they were perusing books, Kerry's friend was asking him questions about the new volunteer position he had taken. Kerry was a volunteer at a lab in UCLA. What was unusual about this particular lab was that it was dedicated to the study of parapsychology. Based in the neuropsychiatric building of the university, the lab was headed up by Dr. Felmer Moss, and for over a decade the lab was dedicated to taking a scientific approach to phenomena that most institutes wouldn't touch. Kerry was coming to the building daily and helping with investigations into psychokinesis, ESP, alternative medicines, poltergeists and hauntings. Understandably, Kerry's friends had many questions and Gaynor was explaining in detail a recent case involving an apparent haunted house that he had worked on. Unbeknown to him, however, someone was eavesdropping on their conversation. On the other side of the aisle, two women were looking for a section of the shop that covered the occult and the paranormal. Kerry was explaining how he really wanted to find a case that could provide irrefutable evidence of a haunting. When one of the women interrupted him, she said, you should come investigate my house. The woman then proceeded to tell Kerry that her house was haunted and that the activity had become violent in some way. Kerry, a little taken aback by her forwardness with his story, took the woman's contact details and promised to be in touch soon, informing her that there would be no charge for coming to investigate as long as they could use it as part of their research. Kerry quickly returned to the parapsychology lab and grabbed the research assistant he worked directly with, the Dr. Barry Taff. Taff had been working at the university's parapsychology lab for a number of years. Taff claims to have investigated over 4,000 different examples of reported hauntings. Out of those that Taff claimed to be legitimate, he would state that only 5% of them would constitute a haunting. The other 95%, he said, were instead examples of poltergeist activity. It's worth getting this difference out of the way early on because it frames Dr. Taft's views on what would follow. In Taft's eyes, a haunting would go on for anywhere from a few months to hundreds of years and would usually take place in a location where a traumatic or violent death had taken place. A poltergeist, however, he claims to be something entirely different. The source of this activity often centers around a young person, either approaching or experiencing puberty. The activity would often involve objects being thrown by a seemingly unseen force, banging and scratching on the walls, spontaneous fires, footsteps, doors opening and closing. This activity appeared to center around a single person usually, and would often follow them wherever they go. Poltergeist activity in his view was not the work of a spirit, but some kind of psychokinesis that a person is creating, often on some kind of subconscious level. Taff listened to what Gaynor had learned from the woman in the bookstore and immediately thought it sounded like another example of poltergeist activity. He agreed they should go, and on August 22nd, the two men headed to the address on Braddock Street in Culver City. They were a little shocked by what they saw. Taff would later describe the house as basically a shack. The house had apparently been listed as condemned by the city twice and should have had no one living inside. Seemingly this woman was living there illegally. The pair knocked on the door and Doris Pfeiffer, the woman Gaynor had met in the bookstore, opened the door and quickly welcomed them in. Pfeiffer, a single mother of three boys and one girl, was at her wit's end and couldn't believe her luck that she had accidentally stumbled upon someone who could help her. Doors had been banging open and closed, strange noises heard, and even the occasional apparition of a human-like figure had been spotted by the entire family in the home. But that wasn't the reason Doris was so desperate for help. She told Taff and Gaynor that she had been sexually assaulted on multiple occasions by a person that she couldn't see. She informed the investigators that there were three entities that appeared to be haunting her family. Two she described as small, one was large, but all three were physically strong 
and were capable of not just physically touching them, but of violent attacks, and that the two smaller entities appear to be doing the bidding of the larger one, restraining Doris so that the larger entity could do what it wanted with her. Taff turned to Gaynor and asked to speak to him privately. While he had heard claims of sexually related touching from apparent paranormal phenomena, he had never heard anything as vivid and disturbing and downright unbelievable as what Doris was laying out to the investigators. While he didn't think she was making it up, due to the very apparent emotional strain recounting the events was having on her, he also didn't think this was something they should be dealing with. Taff informed Gaynor that he believed Doris was unfortunately in need of serious psychological help, not paranormal investigators. The pair sat with Doris for a little over an hour before explaining to her they would not be able to help. Taff gave Doris the contact details to a psychologist who worked in their building and said he would refer her to him to help try to understand what it was she was experiencing. Taff and Gaynor left. They didn't speak much on the drive home, but both were deeply saddened, not just by the conditions the Bifer family were living in, but by the apparent mental health issues the mother was experiencing. However, ten days later, the pair received another call at the lab from Doris. She informed them that she was no longer alone in these strange experiences. Neighbours either side of her home had started to complain about a lot of the phenomena she was experiencing although not the assaults. This piqued the pair's interest and the following day they returned to the home. As they entered, before Doris could say anything, they were hit with a foul stench that Taft described as the unmistakable odour of rotting, decomposing flesh. Doris informed them that the activity had become increasingly frequent since they had last visited. Being a hot August day, the house was baking hot as it had no air conditioning. But as Doris led the pair to her bedroom, where she claimed most of the activity was taking place, they were hit by a wall of cold air the second they stepped in. The bedroom was freezing cold. The trio then retreated to the kitchen as Doris continued to inform the investigators about the strange events that had been taking place, not just in her home, but in that of her next door neighbours. When all of a sudden, in front of the men's eyes, they saw one of the low doors on the kitchen cabinets seemingly open by itself. More shockingly, this was quickly followed by a frying pan flying out of the cupboard, rising up in the air before coming crashing down to the floor in an arc shape. The pair stood in a stunned silence. Doris felt vindicated. But Taff was suspicious. They had obviously not taken Doris's story seriously on the first trip and he was concerned that Doris had somehow set up this display for them. But no one else was in the room. The pair investigated the cupboard carefully, looking for springs or strings that could explain what they saw. But they found nothing. Doris informed them that this was not the first time objects had been thrown. On one occasion, the fuse box appeared to be ripped out of the wall and thrown. And on a number of occasions, candelabras that were dotted throughout the house, were all seen zipping through the air. More often than not, these objects appeared to be thrown in the direction of Doris. Taff now decided that there might be something to Doris' story after all, and this began a ten-week investigation into the haunting of Doris Bifer. The entire life of the family was flipped on its head almost instantly. The dark, rundown home was now filled daily, with up to 25 people at a time, mostly parapsychology researchers and students from the university, as well as a handful of photographers at times. This instantly brought Doris some relief. It appeared the sexually related attacks immediately stopped once the investigation began. Although her eldest son did report one evening, witnessing his mother being beaten by an unseen force. When he rushed to help her, he was physically thrown across the room by whatever was attacking her, crashing to the floor. This was apparently one of the only physical altercations that took place, however, and after weeks of being assaulted in her bed, 
this apparent weakening in the abilities of the entity was very welcomed by Doris. The people inside the home reported the familiar experiences we often see with poltergeist cases. Doors opening and closing on their own. Strange sounds being heard around the house. And sudden temperature changes throughout the property. The most common occurrence that the investigators reported witnessing was the presence of strange, unexplained lights in the home. They began to see these yellowy green balls of light that would dart around the rooms quickly and in all different directions. Taft described them as plasma-like in substance and around the size of a human fist. Gaynor and Taft could find no source for these lights, so their first thought was that they must be coming through the window somehow, maybe reflected by passing cars. So they affixed black poster boards to the walls of the property, held up with duct tape, which sealed off all external light sources. However, not only did this not stop the lights, it actually made them more visible as they were illuminated in the now darkened home. The lights also appeared to be reacting to the investigators in the home in some way. At one point, Gaynor claims that he spoke to a light that was darting around next to a wall, suspicious that maybe someone was projecting it somehow. He instructed the light to move away from the wall. To his surprise, it did moving into the centre of the room and spinning on the spot. However, Taff seemed less impressed by the apparent sentience of the lights. He attempted to communicate with spirits, if that was in fact what these visual anomalies were, asking them to manipulate lights or create sounds to answer yes or no questions. But while they did seem to get some responses, he claimed they didn't really make sense, and mostly dismissed them as not being compelling evidence. The lights and other strange phenomena were having a profound effect on the other investigators though, who had never witnessed anything to this level before. Gaynor says that at one point they heard a loud thud in the opposite room. They rushed in to find not one but two of the male investigators had fainted as they witnessed the balls of light shooting around them. Attempts were made repeatedly to capture this phenomena on camera. Professional photographer Dick Thompson was in the location on numerous occasions, trying to get a good photo of the balls. He claimed it was extremely difficult to do so with their erratic movements that he described as almost violent at times. However, a number of photos were taken inside the property, the most famous of which appears to show Doris cowering on her bed as numerous investigators surround her. Above her appears to be an arc of light Gaynor explained that this arc wasn't what they were seeing in person. They could see a ball zipping around. He suspects the low shutter speed of the camera simply created a trail, demonstrating where the light had moved to. A second photo captures a similar visual anomaly, with two arcs seemingly crossing over one another. A number of these photos were sent to the magazine Popular Photography. The negatives of the photographs were authenticated by the editor of the magazine, who was flabbergasted by the images. He claimed he had never seen anything like it, and couldn't explain what he was seeing in the photographs. They would be the only images of apparent paranormal phenomena the prestigious magazine would ever publish. It would be a few weeks into the case when the investigators would witness what many of them described as the most terrifying moment of the entire investigation. One evening, Doris was sitting on her bed. Yet again, the now familiar light orbs were zipping around the room, seemingly orbiting Doris. There were four of them on this occasion, and at one point, to the confusion of the witnesses, all four lights suddenly retreated to the corner of the room, right by Doris's bed. The lights appeared to be growing closer, until they started to merge into one another, before seemingly starting to take on a shape of some kind. Taff and a large number of the other researchers claim they saw what appeared to be the apparition of the upper torso of a large man, forming in the air above the bed, right on top of where Doris sat, who stared up at it, her mouth agape at what she was witnessing. The investigators had finally been given a glimpse 
of whatever it was Doris had claimed had been attacking her all those weeks before. After this event, the investigators were all asked to submit individual reports of what they had seen, and apparently all wrote the events in an almost identical manner. Yet despite cameras going off constantly during the event, nothing was captured on film. The lack of decent photographic evidence was becoming an increasingly frustrating part of the investigation, and film cameras were brought in to try and capture moving images of the phenomena. But this proved fruitless as well. Despite what they could see with their eyes, the team were having a hard time capturing it definitively on camera. It was at times almost like something was blocking the camera's ability to take images. As Gaynor describes in one strange incident, one evening Doris started to scream that the apparition was in her bedroom. The team raced in there. Doris pointed to the corner of her room once again and said it's there, but they couldn't see a thing. Gaynor had a Polaroid camera. He pointed the camera at the wall and took a photo. The picture came out, completely bleached out. Assuming it was simply overexposed, Gaynor asked if it was still in the corner. She said yes, so he took another Polaroid. Again, nothing was visible at all in the image. After a few seconds, Doris claimed that the apparition was gone. Gaynor took two photos again of the corner in quick succession. Both came out perfectly fine. Moments later, a sudden cold breeze shot through the house and through the doorway into the bedroom, followed by a smell that was so strong it caused some team members to vomit. Gaynor took another Polaroid in the direction the breeze had come from. Yet again, the image was almost completely bleached out, except for what appeared to be the bottom of the door. In front of it, there was what appears to be a small ball of light. Again, several moments passed before Doris screamed again. She claimed the apparition was now right in front of her face, this now familiar outline of a human, mere inches from her eyes. Again, Gaynor took two photos, and it was exposed with a bleached out look that appeared to be centered around Doris's face. Once again, once the entity retreated and was gone, Gaynor attempted to take a photo again, and the image came out fine. The odd scratch that appears in front of Doris's face, apparently being an artifact from the team attempting to clean the photo up later. Back at the parapsychology lab, Dr. Moss was a little skeptical about the entire thing, and was concerned that so many of her researchers had been dedicated to this one case for so long. However, she trusted Taff, and would allow the research to continue for the time being. She didn't see any reason why Taff or any of her students would lie about what they were experiencing, but she felt there must be some kind of explanation. Taff told her that he didn't understand what was happening in the house. All he knew was that they were repeatedly seeing things that they could not explain. A couple of days later, late in the evening, Doris called Taff in floods of tears. He grabbed Gaynor and the pair headed to the Bifer home at around midnight to find the place a wreck. All of the large poster boards and duct tape had been ripped off the walls so violently that they covered the floor with paint and plaster that had been pulled away with it. Taff thought that while it was possible Doris had pulled them down, he described her as a small frail woman and was surprised she had the strength to do this. She appeared genuinely traumatized when they arrived and was screaming that she saw them being torn off the walls. But there was still a part of Taft that suspected she may have done this for more attention, something he had witnessed while investigating other paranormal cases. But they couldn't prove it one way or the other. The investigation continued after this, although the activity seemed to start to lessen with each passing week. They continued to gather data, bringing in Geiger counters at one point. The team claimed they would pick up normal background radiation throughout the house. However, when any activity was taking place, the counters would read absolutely nothing at all, as though all the background radiation was temporarily sucked into some kind of void. They attempted to track down the source of the strong odours that would appear and disappear at random, 
but despite checking under the house, the plumbing, and anywhere that a potential animal could have gotten in and died, they were never able to find a source. They experienced a similarly frustrating experience while attempting to collect data on the temperature drops. Any time they attempted to use thermal equipment on one of these cold spots, the temperature would read as totally normal. Late into the investigation, Dr. Moss actually attended the home one evening. She did not witness a single incident during her time there. Although the team had already stated that things appeared to be starting to quiet down, she was strongly beginning to suspect that she should put an end to this entire event, and couldn't help but notice that Doris, while seemingly experiencing something, was also not the most stable individual. Her apparent issues with drinking had become apparent to Taff almost from the moment they met her, but over the weeks Taff had actually noticed something interesting in that regard when connected to the phenomena. Whenever Doris was drinking heavily, the activity in the house increased. When she was sober, especially for an extended period of time, the activity calmed drastically. This fueled Taft's theory that this was not the work of any sort of ghost or otherworldly being, but a phenomena being created by this woman that we simply don't have a way to explain yet. However, Dr. Moss didn't need to pull the plug on the investigation. Over the last few months, Doris had been storing away as much money as she could to get her family out of there. She still firmly believed her house was haunted, and without telling the investigation team, she took her family and swiftly moved, essentially putting an end to the case at that time. During the investigation, a writer by the name of Frank de Felita had begun talking to Doris regularly about what was going on in her home and had struck up quite a close relationship with her. While he had no formal plans to write about Doris's case at that time, he was certainly keeping an eye on events with that possible intention in mind. While Doris hadn't kept in touch with Dr. Taff, she had kept in contact with Frank, and with her permission he revealed to the investigators where she had moved to. Why had she done that, after seemingly moving away and trying to start anew? Well, it appeared that moving had not helped the Bifer family one bit. Within weeks of Doris moving into her new house, the phenomena started up all over again. Interestingly, yet again both houses on either side of Doris's new home reported the same type of phenomena. The neighbours had no idea what Doris had been through previously. They were just confused and didn't make the connection to their new neighbour, who had kept her story quiet, concerned that her new community would think she was crazy. She was almost attempting to bury her head in the sand and hope it wouldn't escalate to the same levels again. But both Doris and her neighbours reported cupboards and doors opening and closing by themselves, garbage being poured out onto the floor, electrical devices turning off and on at random. The investigators visited her new home, and what followed would be what I think is one of the creepier moments in this whole investigation. They turned the lights out, Taff had a recorder with a microphone next to him, placed right by his leg. Suddenly a vase flew off the sideboard and crashed into the floor right in the middle of the investigators, much like the frying pan all those weeks before. Nothing else seemed to happen. However, when they played the audio tape back, they had apparently captured something else happening at the time. They could hear the sound of deep breathing, getting closer and closer to the microphone, along with a footstep, then another footstep, and then a dragging sound. This repeated as the sound got closer and closer to the mic, and then the audio recorder just shut itself off. No one in the room was making sounds like this, and no one had approached Taff or the microphone. Towards the end of the time Doris lived in this new property, the investigators were sat with her in her bedroom. The lights turned down low. They had once again covered the walls in boards and duct tape. 
when suddenly they got to see what had happened. That night Doris called them in floods of tears. They witnessed the tape being pulled from the wall as though it was being ripped off by an unseen hand. Very quickly. The boards flew off and hit Doris in the head. Gaynor, in a move that I imagine did not impress Doris, asked whatever it was to do it again, and is obliged, throwing another board in the direction of Doris. This was enough for Doris, who still seemed convinced she could somehow outrun whatever was doing this to her. She packed up her family again and moved to San Bernardino, Frank de Felita was able to keep in touch with her during this time, and claimed that she was still experiencing the same phenomena. Before the investigators could catch up with her, however, she once again moved, this time to Texas, and cut off all contact with everyone. Taff apparently had no idea that Frank was writing a book about their case, until he contacted him and asked the doctor to help write the final chapters of the book creating a storyline that expressed how Taff would have liked the investigation to have actually continued. His next step would have been to bring her into the lab and run further tests. To his knowledge, Doris did not seek the same level of psychiatric help that is depicted in the book and movie, despite suggesting she should in that first meeting. But he claimed it does really get across the level of stress and fear he witnessed in Doris every time he interacted with her. Gaynor and Taff were brought on as technical advisors to the movie adaptation of the entity, which led to Taff being invited to a screening of the movie at Fox Studios in 1983. There, much to his surprise, he saw Doris. The pair had a short moment to talk. While she stated she liked the film, Taff got the sense she was uneasy with the attention she was receiving but grateful they were trying to help her tell her story and help her to understand what was happening to her. She did not apparently divulge any information about what had happened to her since she moved to Texas. And that was the last time he ever saw her. In the years following the case, a whole number of people have apparently come out claiming to have been part of the investigation team and spreading misinformation about the whole thing. Taff has called out a number of these people as simply attempting to get attention. Meanwhile, he has continued to talk about the Bifer case and several others that he has been involved with over the years. Skeptical Inquirer magazine have done a few articles on the case, concluding that while there is no evidence of the Bifer case being an outright hoax, there does appear to be a mix of psychological disturbance, the power of suggestion, and poor investigation skills of a group of student researchers who, while well-meaning and seemingly convinced they had uncovered something paranormal, didn't have the abilities to create compelling evidence. Taff himself states on numerous occasions that they were not very well versed on how to use the camera equipment, often resulting in poorly exposed photographs. However, he also says that professional photographers were also brought in but they too failed to capture any of the phenomena on camera. Dr. Taff instantly dismissed the claims of assault Doris experienced because they did not take place during their investigation. While he can't be absolutely certain what was the cause of the incidents, he does seem to very much lean towards the idea that Doris was creating all of these events on some kind of psychic level. The investigators, frustratingly, never got much info on Doris's life leading up to the events in the house. While they did ask her questions, they would never get a straight answer, refusing to even reveal to the investigators her age. It did quickly become apparent from the pieces of information they were able to get that there was a certain degree of trauma in the life of Doris Bifer. She had been disowned by her family as a teenager and when they met her, she was raising a family in a condemned building. It was apparent she also had a drinking problem, and there was evidence to suggest she may have also been a drug user, or at least was in her past. I'm a little confused as to how many of the children were actually living with Doris at the time, with some sources stating she was in fact only living in the house 
with her three sons, and that her daughter had potentially been taken away, but I'm not 100% sure on this detail. In later years, the middle son, Brian, gave an interview to the writer Javier Ortega. He claimed that she was thrown out by her family for living a rambunctious lifestyle and being rebellious. At a young age, she liked to play with Ouija boards and conduct seances before turning to drugs and alcohol. Although the interview Brian gave saw him contradict himself numerous times. The man who conducted the interview with Brian Harris doesn't believe he was intentionally trying to mislead him with the interview he gave. Instead, claiming he was quite emotional about the whole thing, especially when it came to facts about his mother being spread that he claimed were not true. His interview was jumbled and messy, but he appeared to just want to set the record straight about the type of person his mother was. While she did enjoy a drink, Brian claimed that she was not the drunk the investigators had implied she was. There were suggestions that the entities were somehow being manifested through her mind, and that they took on the form of three men because she had three boys in the house. But Brian disputes this, claiming that these entities were very real, and that he saw them himself. This interview was apparently conducted as part of a book being written on the full life story of Doris Pfeiffer, but as far as I can tell it was never completed. Her other two sons have also spoken out about the events. When researchers interviewed Doris's other two sons, they discovered that Brian had a similar relationship to drink and drugs as his mother had. However, the other two sons did back up some of Brian's claims. They claimed that there had been some level of paranormal activity before moving to the condemned house on Braddock Street, including objects moving and the occasional appearance of some kind of apparition. While living in Braddock Street, both boys claimed to witness the same phenomena their mother reported, with one boy apparently being awoken terrifyingly in the middle of the night by being slapped across the face. But when he opened his eyes, there was no one there. Another reported walking down their hallway one evening before hitting something and falling to the ground. He stated that it felt like he had just walked into a person, but yet again, there was no one there. We'll end this story with an incident that the boys claimed happened just a few days after they moved into the house on Braddock Street. I'm not sure how to take this detail, due to the fact they also claimed that there was some level of activity taking place before they even moved there, but it is interesting nonetheless. One afternoon, shortly after moving in, there was a knock at the door. Doris answered it to see an elderly Mexican woman standing before her. She apparently stared blankly at Doris for a few seconds before saying, you need to get out. I used to live here in this old house back when it was just a farm and I was a little girl. There is something very evil here. This place is haunted, and you need to get out. When Doris asked what she was talking about, the woman went deadly silent and walked away. Doris nor the boys ever saw the woman again. Doris Byfield would die in 1999, apparently aged 59, of respiratory failure. If these incidents followed her into later life, we will apparently never know. That's all for this entry into the tape library. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on this case. I really want to encourage the comments section to become a place where people can discuss theories or additional information that I may have missed here. So please do respond to other comments if you can, and let's get a bit of a conversation going. I hope that this community can become a friendly, welcoming place for us all to discuss the unexplained. We've got some great episodes coming up next month, so if you haven't already, please do subscribe so you don't miss out. And if you want to support the channel, you can do that really simply by clicking the like button under the video. Thank you for sticking with me until the end. Until next time, 
pleasant dreams. <laughs>